Welcome to the third lecture in Drawing Translation for Spring 2021. This lecture is called Mark Making, Seeing Graphic Design in Drawing Process. I'm going to be talking about how to recognize the value of mark making and being able to more or less extract different graphic icons and um, what will eventually become pattern and texture from drawing to be used in later compositions, which range from uses such as posters, editorial design. Um, we're not going to look at packaging in this lecture, but it certainly could be applied and I'll, I'll sort of muse on that a little bit later. I wanna start off with an artist who is kind of near and dear to me because my high school art teacher really liked her work and I do too. So Keita Kulwitz uh, was a a very prolific German printmaker, especially during a time when women artists were not really given their dues, especially um, even though those inequalities still persist today, Keta Kulwitz was really um, undervalued and only her work only came to great significance, unfortunately, after her death. Her life was also very tragic in many ways. Most of her children died, and so there's a kind of deep sadness to her work. But what contrasts that, which we can see in this portrait, is a liveliness of line. There's lots of life in her line work and the way that lines um, layer onto one another in order to eventually create clustering and shape. And there's lots of vibrancy in the kind of, um, not chaotic, but very rhythmic way that she applied her marks. So what I want to talk about here is how to zero in on some of those marks and appreciate them more in a graphic design context. So first, we need to distill this down, and the easiest way to do that is to just get closer and focus on the actual marks rather than looking at the composition or considering its meaning. So I'm just going to zero in on an area here in the knuckles and look and appreciate how there's a nice variance of line width and direction. Some of the lines are quite, um, or I shouldn't say quite precise, but are more precise than others. There's looping and looseness at the same time that there's you know, repetition of straight lines towards the bottom along the top of that knuckle to communicate a plane and a direction in space. So we have form and structure, but also looseness and what one could call irregularity. Um, and so not the same kind of line really being done over and over again in this small amount of space. So if we blow that up, unfortunately, we're going to have a little pixelated view of this because this image is, is only 72 dpi to begin with. But we can start to see that there are patterns emerging, even in just this cropping, this very small piece. So we have several lines that arc at the top, several lines that are, you know, uh, uh, more or less stacked uh, in the same direction along the bottom. And then, of course, thicker lines, which divide the composition into roughly thirds and also create a sense of movement because they're activating the diagonal. Then, once we bring it into a program like Photoshop, we can uh, heighten the levels, so the extremes of the dark to light, in order to get rid of the fuzziness. And then we can also reduce down through the middle values and really sort of um, what you might call kind of crisp up those lines. So the lines, actually some of them disappear, other ones grow thicker, but what we're left with is kind of the skeleton or the, the underlying uh, layer beneath the lines that were actually made in the drawing process. And now we can think about this, especially because it's in black, stark black and white, so we have a positive negative interchange of space, we can think about this more as a graphic composition, meaning that it's really relying on um, basic principles and elements of designs like shape, line, space, texture, uh, value in order to not communicate something specific, but to give a sense of movement, rhythm, emphasis. So those are what we would call the principles of designs rather than the elements that I just listed. So specifically, I want you also to think about how even in this small uh, excerpt of Colwitz's self-portrait, that there is a flow. And this is something to um, pay attention to in your own work. Look for areas where there's a nice uh, back and forth or what we call an interchange between not only directions, but also positive and negative space. And here we also can see a real sense of kind of foreground and background emerging where we have 
marks that are larger and appearing to come towards us in space versus those that kind of repeat and also um, reduce distance between them as they move further away in this corner. So there's a kind of pinching and a push-pull where the space in the middle of this um, mini composition, we could call it, feels like it is really bulging out in space and coming closer to us. And then we can also appreciate areas of detail or emphasis. We could even just crop it down further and this kind of little island of black mark here has its own graphic wonderfulness. Um, there's a nice strong gesture, so hierarchically this is the main, uh, you know, the focal point, the main mark, but then we have these little satellite marks that are kind of acting as supporting actors in that way. And of course there's lots of interest here. It undulates, it's moving diagonally as well. There's a nice kind of productive tension in the little areas of tightness between the shapes. So we could go on and on and appreciate these smaller areas of graphic um, visual interest, um, but we also want to think about how to take very, uh, you know, a small area and then do more with it, transform it into something that better suits our needs, perhaps. So I'll start out with this, uh, just some loose, this is actually um, acrylic paint, so black acrylic paint, and that's why you can kind of see in this high resolution scan that there's some glossiness because it's almost sculptural as it, as it raises up a little bit. There was enough paint to create a little bit of layering there. And I'm going to isolate this mark and then translate it much in the same way that I did with um, the Colwitz Pete's, or Colwitz Pete's piece earlier. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it's quite a tongue twister, apparently. And now we can, we can talk about different ways to translate this, meaning that um, we don't transform it completely, but we put it through a series of processes that change it bit by bit until it has a new appearance and maybe also a new uh, capacity to function. And what I mean by that is that stops, it ceases to become a single mark, but we can start to use it as a system, break it apart into smaller pieces and recombine them in interesting ways. This is really the goal of any uh, graphic design composition or exercise, is to find that sweet spot where you can create variations on a theme. So let's talk about these methods of translation. One of the first and probably the most obvious ones is that we can take whatever it is that we've done and we can rotate it. Rotation is important um, as creatures who are upright most of the time and not uh, standing on our heads a lot of the time, it actually creates a very new sense of perspective and can draw our attention to parts of the mark that maybe we weren't seeing as, as very important when we were looking from a different orientation. We can also obviously take advantage of scale and think about how details when they're reduced, sometimes they don't disappear but they uh, they submerge into the background of our consciousness and um, even how other um, some of the other details become more significant. So in the smaller version, this kind of, uh, we could call it a nose or a beak on this mark, actually becomes much more prominent once we reduce it further in scale. So that's something unique that I wouldn't have noticed right away about this if we were only dealing with this kind of larger scan and um, and particular rotation of the image. And then there are three other methods of translation that we have at our disposal. We can think about shifting the direction, so opposing directions. We can think about proximity, the amount of space placed between them, and then what happens when that is duplicated and creates a kind of channel or a flow of space. And then obviously throughout all of these we have repetition at our disposal. And by altering these all a little bit at the same time, so in this last one we're really, you know, we're reducing proximity and increasing repetition by kind of manipulating two or more methods of translation at any one time, then you're really starting to get somewhere new, um, still recognizable and based on the original mark, but creating something and inventing something, actually, I would say, that wasn't there before and kind of really pushing the base material that you started out with into a, a new territory of use and critical thinking. Now I want to talk about what I'll call loosely some mark-making masters. Uh, the first one that I'd like to 
talk about is Ed Moses, who recently died actually in 2018. Um, he was an artist for many years in the San Francisco Bay Area in California in the US. And he was a very complex thinker who liked to use simple techniques. This piece is actually done in all in either uh, compressed charcoal or acrylic ink and masking tape, very basic tools at his disposal and more or less making a grid. Um, thinking also about how to best activate that grid within the composition, you can see that the diagonal sort of skewing of that grid, um, but then having the, the uh, axes of the grid, so the up and down and the left to right run parallel to the shape of the the paper that it's on itself it creates this wonderful tension where it feels like everything is torquing and rotating but what ed moses also does really well is he gets the most out of any mark the most out of any line that he can make notice that none of these lines are the same some of them are very similar but they all have little nuances that make them feel like each one was carefully considered and of course that wasn't the case. He's working in a very clear system. He lays down the tape, he makes his line, he pulls up the tape, he makes another line. But it creates something that can't be reproduced, even though he's using this strict kind of system. And that is a really lovely thing about mark making, is that every mark is unique and deserves to kind of be appreciated on its own. But we as designers have to look purposely for that, recognize the potential of those marks, and then put them to good use in another form. Another piece by Ed Moses, this one is much more loose, um, and we can see that there's a lot more of the actual implement at work here. Implement is a word that refers to any of the actual tools, the drawing tools that you hold in your hand while you're working. So it could be something like a pencil, or it could be a brush, or it could be something far less conventional like a feather, maybe, that you're working with to draw charcoal or ink down the page. In this piece, this is all done in acrylic, and so it's paint, but notice how chalky it seems. There's lots of texture in the brush marks. There's lots of um, effort here to really emphasize the pressure, the weight, and the presence of the human hand. And I think that it's safe to say that humans are drawn to this kind of aesthetic naturally, and that um, finding ways to draw out, you know, really powerful little marks that you can make with your own hands um, will immediately help people kind of feel related to your design and, um, you know, identify in a way because they see the humanness in it. So that's why analog media, even in our digital age, I think still has a lot of importance in creating compelling design. And then another sort of mark making master that I'd like to highlight is the fashion illustrator Antonio Lopez. He's also no longer alive. Um, but he was very prolific throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, he was a queer uh, uh, Latino illustrator, which um, you know wasn't completely unique, but he gained a lot of fame at a time when the industry was really dominated by white men. And I think one of the things that he did that's really um, very sophisticated, but also kind of loose and raw, is what you can see here in these portraits of the fashion icon from the 80s, Tina Chow, where these are both of her and he's taking slightly different directions in it, but he's not hiding the medium or the implement as he's making these drawings. You know, scribbles, but done with a, a very thick, broad implement and done in a way that's very confident, become a gesture, they're very loose and kind of effervescent in a way, feeling to the viewer, but they're also really structural. They form the structure in one kind of bold move that even with these little rivers, these channels of white space in between, it actually starts to create a sense of volume because it's just so dense in comparison to some of the other lighter touches with these washes. And I love this right side version, especially this kind of abstract mark that comes down on the right hand side and structures the whole composition. It feels as if she's emerging from shadow, but it could also be black fabric or it could also just be energy and vibrancy. And the marks are so simple, but so direct and powerful and they communicate all of those things at once. All right, now let's turn to a couple of examples of real designers who are 
uh, incorporating mark making into their methods. So the first example I'll talk about is actually a campaign that was put on by Nike. Um, and they hired the uh, Amsterdam-based design studio Vieden and Kennedy. And this was back in 2004. Um, and the design studio, basically, they did freeform paint mark illustrations, which I'm putting up right now, uh, on very large pieces of canvas, uh, sometimes, you know, working in a kind of Jackson Pollock-like style where they were th uh, throwing or flipping the paint along the surface. And they did several of these and then digitized them and sort of painstakingly uh, traced them, not auto-traced, but traced them by hand in Illustrator, so that they were vectors that were large enough to be blown up to, um, as you can see from the installation photo over here, you know, they're, they're twice as high as the average human being, probably, you know, uh, I'm going to guess here, uh, almost 20 feet wide by the end of it. So they had to be very high quality images. But this interesting collage translation where they've taken, you know, someone photographed in athletic wear, taken them out and then substituted the line work as the kind of skeletal structure of the figure. And I just think it's a brilliant use of mark making that is very in touch with Nike's brand, which is all about energy, vivacity, um, you know, that idea of just doing it, like the force um, of being present and active. And I think that that's accomplished in this mode of drawing where you're really embracing what the line wants to do and what the ink in this case or the medium wants to do. A couple more examples. This next one is by a Japanese design studio, Tokyo Pistol, and their client is a, um, a local art university that also has an extensive library and museum on campus, Musashino. And the, I think this is a, a very kind of crude type treatment in some ways. This is finger painting, but I love the textures that they combine it with and these large sort of ink swatches that ground the composition. And there's a delicacy to the opacity changes that makes, and especially the way that they move in front of some of this type, that makes the finger painting seem um, really well considered. It is the, it is, you know, embodying this idea of aggression. The title of the play is The Young Aggressive. Um, but it's also done in a very playful way that feels sort of off kilter, very spontaneous, as if it's, you know, they, they just sort of walked out onto the sidewalk and painted onto it and took a photo, even though we can see there's some, uh, you know, some very careful textured layering of collage work that's going on in this composition. But I also really like how they were thinking about the freeness and kind of the crude, you know, these are bad letter forms in a lot of ways, but how that contrasts beautifully against this very structured sort of bill that they have stamped on that has all of the essential information on it at the bottom of the composition. Um, and obviously the idea of activating space through this kind of stark figure ground um, with these heavy black marks um, also is in contrast to the kind of the more delicate lighter exchange of figure ground in that bottom part of the composition. Um, a very different kind of purpose here, but a similar take. Um, this is for the London fashion, men's fashion company called A Sauvage. And this was done by um, Fuel Design in London. And I think the thing, I won't say too, too much about this because I think I've, I've kind of alluded to um, in previous images how the mark making here is really successful or successfully integrated, I should say. But beyond those things, what stands out to me is how it's communicating process through the repetition of these shapes and kind of crossing things out at the same time that it's highlighting them. And again, it adds a really... Um, a beautiful sense of urgency and presence to it through the human hand, even though these marks are, you know, they are structural. This is sort of mimicking the up-down axis of the photograph. The arm is, you know, we could argue resting on it. This is sort of directing our attention, boxing us in visually in a way and directing our attention to the model. So they're functioning structurally within the composition but in other ways, there's a, a kind of, and we talked about this, or I talked about it, I should say, in the primer lecture, um, there's a, a measure of index or indexicality in this where we see the human hand 
and we identify with it in a kind of, I would say in some ways because of the scribbliness, a kind of childlike, whimsical way. Okay, lastly, I just want to talk about some lessons from a really um, esteemed Japanese artist who you have probably heard of at some point before, named Hokusai. And he was a painter, but also a printmaker, and I think some of his prints um, and drawings uh, for those prints really yield a lot of important lessons. So this piece, Two Trees, from the 1830s, we can see a, a real kind of transition from drawing, thinking about drawing as line, to thinking about drawing as shape, and using the implement in a way where we're almost kind of stamping, or, and what I mean by that is kind of just pressing the edge of the implement down onto the paper, as well as creating very fine lines with the tip of that element. And here, the shape is also, um, and we saw this with the gesture drawing in the last model, is kind of standing in for shadow, and value and weight and giving more um, emphasis to certain parts of the subject matter. So use of all of the drawing implement, think about not just the tip of the drawing implement, and this goes for pencils and uh, brushes and blocks, as in chalk and charcoal. Think about the tip and using also the sides and think about splaying if you are using a brush, sort of spreading out the brush and seeing what that does to uh, the kind of mark making that you're able to accomplish. Um, Hokusai and many Japanese printmakers actually, you can see this kind of careful oscillation or going back and forth between moments of chaos or what appears to be kind of messy chaos and then pulling it in and having these tight little moments of detail. So being kind of rough and broad with the brush here and then just dotting ever so slightly to add little areas of emphasis. And we can also see that here, right? There's a lot of restraint in the bottom with leaving all of this negative space and these kind of almost, you know, hurried, angry marks next to it to describe the texture of the bark on the tree. So there's a wonderful balance between chaos and control. And then lastly, uh, in terms of these lessons that we can learn, um, which I kind of just alluded to, there's a, a really maximal use of negative space. Rather than being afraid of negative space, it's concentrating our marks in a meaningful way and then letting the rest of the composition breathe. And what I mean by hold the space is that it, we actually get a sense that it's filling the space and kind of compressing the subject matter. So it directs our eyes to it but also feels like, in terms of weight and gravity, that it's holding that subject matter in place, and that that empty space is not actually empty. And then very quickly, another Hokusai print that I wanted to highlight is this, a landscape with a seaside village from around the 1840s. And the reason that this is uh, such a wonderful example is that there's almost nothing here other than mark making. The houses are the most sort of individual marks that we can see in the village. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, separate lines coming together to create form. But otherwise, the ocean and the mountain in the background are basically just long brush marks that don't even connect with one another. It's just the, the, the proximity, the repetition, and uh, the lightness, you know, having control over the lighter washes so that it feels like they kind of dissipate. And that creates all of the sense of space and so much of a, a sense of place and detail when actually there aren't many marks on the page. And just to garner a little bit of extra wisdom from Hokusai, I wanted to include this quote, which he was very humble about his abilities, even though he was a master painter and printmaker. At 73, I learned a little about the real structure of animals, plants, birds, fishes, and insects. Consequently, when I am 80, I'll have made more progress. At 90, I'll have penetrated the mystery of things. At 100, I shall have reached something marvelous. But when I am 110, everything I do, the smallest dot, will be alive. And unfortunately, Hokusai did not live to be 110. But I think it's a really lovely philosophy to have that as you get older and experience life, that more of that life actually moves into your hand and that the lines that we make uh, are carrying as vessels more and more life as we become more observant of it and more aware of it in our surroundings. All right, well, we've reached the end, so I'd just like to do a quick recap here on what was covered and conclude this lecture. 
So first, um, as graphic designers, we need to recognize mark making as another one of the design tools in our toolkit. And I think that it's for students these days an underutilized one. Uh, we're losing touch a little bit with the value of analog media in digital compositions. So I want you to reconsider that if you haven't, or if you have considered it before, and I'd like you to you know consider it for the first time if it hasn't crossed your mind uh, as part of your your design practice going forward. Uh, second, becoming adept at seeing the macro and the micro. So in order to recognize those marks, we first have to zoom in and we have to really be able to visually appreciate uh, the littlest details and to see them in comparison and in relation to the larger picture. Uh, translating marks and transforming them. So it's not enough just to pull things out of their context, but really as designers, how can we remake them? and uh, learn different methods of translation that will make them, you know, even more communicative and meaningful in their new context uh, versus their old one. And then finally, towing the line between description and abstraction. So mark making is a wonderful way to describe things, um, but we don't want to get to the point where it's, you know, we're trying to represent things through our marks. Uh, and what I mean by that is just trying to make it literal. Uh, mark making is, is very much abstract and we should embrace that. So when it comes to things like expressing feelings, um, to, you know, communicating things like music or, um, or emotion or generally things that can't be put into words, that primal kind of quality is embodied really well by mark making. And so in our design work, um, it's about knowing when to rely on it, when to bring it in. And I think that Again, as I've mentioned throughout, when you need that element of human presence and kind of urgency and bring the body into visually what it is that you're doing to express it um, as whatever assignment or project you might be working on as this very human thing or issue, mark making can be that tool in your kit that will allow you to do that reliably well uh, each and every time. All right, thanks for your attention and enjoy those marks.